Hey everyone, Tim here from Snap Attack. Let's dig into this week's Threat Snapshot. So this one's going to be action-packed. There's a lot of information that's been circulating around and want to touch on the high points. So first up, let's talk about Proxy Not Shell. So if you remember last year, um, there were a couple of CVEs around Microsoft Exchange, and this was the Proxy Shell vulnerability. Um, proxy Not Shell is going to look a lot like it. Um, in fact, if you're looking at the logs and some of the artifacts, it looks almost the same. Um, differences here is that uh, this version is going to require authentication. So any user uh, in your environment that has an Exchange account could theoretically exploit this. Um, again, that could be a malicious insider, but more likely someone whose account was compromised by an attacker and is being used here. So again, this affects you if you have an on-prem exchange server. Um, it goes back several versions, 2013, 16, 19, and this is actively being exploited in the wild. So you can take a little look at this. Um, Kevin Beaumont has a really good thread, um, kind of deep diving this as he does for a lot of other CVEs. Um, again, it'll talk through uh, really everything about the timeline if you wanna see some historical context here. Um, going back to the actual source here, so this was um, GTSC. Uh, they were the ones who actually found this during a blue team assessment, passed it off to their red team to reproduce, and again, this auto discover URL, specifically with this PowerShell command, um, this is going to be very familiar to the proxy shell attacks. Um, one thing I will note is they did not really disclose the vulnerability in here in terms of how to reproduce um, step by step. So there aren't any uh, POC exploits floating around. Um, you will see fake POC exploits. Um, this is not Kevin Beaumont, though it may look like it. This is an imposter. These have been popping up quite frequently. Again, it looks and smells almost like it's the real thing um, until they're telling you you have to go pay um, you know, Bitcoin to go buy the exploit and uh, none of these tools actually have the actual exploit in them. So stay away from these. I'm not even gonna post the URL here because I don't want to um, you know, encourage this sort of behavior and I'm glad that GitHub has been taking these down. So again, in absence of a POC here, let's take a look and do a throwback to proxy shell. So again, this is a remote code execution uh, vulnerability. Uh, proxy shell originally being unauthenticated against um, on-prem exchange servers, not proxy or proxy not shell being authenticated. Similar path. Um, there's definitely been some research into, uh, again, that area of the code on Microsoft's um, you know, exchange server. And there likely are other vulnerabilities around this too, or at least that was hinted. So um, we can go through their public POCs for proxy Proxy shell, you can take a look at this. Um, this one here, we've got um, a Python script on a Linux server, where again, we can you know, load that up, we can you know, run the attack. I'm just gonna kind of skip around here a little bit, but um, up here we can you know, click, you're gonna see this, and now we've got the web shell up there, and now we can also interact with commands. So running who am I, you know, running other you know, commands on the host. So. Um, have this in snap attack. You can take a look at what the, the threat is, what it leaves behind. Um, I will note that, again, on the physical exchange server here, there isn't a lot of interesting stuff um, that's popping up. You can actually see the web shell being dropped in that folder, but that was if you were you know, actively looking at it. Um, however, I will say that proxy shell in particular, um, this does light up on the process graph. So um, W3WP, so this is um, the IIS process here that's running, and this is where the Exchange Server um, Outlook Web App OA is running, and as well as all those other services. So again, when we're using that web shell, we can see here that cmd.exe spawning with who am I, um, lots of different things to detect on. Um, I will note, again, W3WP in particular, um, I guess in this instance that we're running and likely others, it is running at a high system integrity level context, so they don't have to escalate privileges, um, so that can be pretty detrimental, also kind of impacting the severity of this a little bit. Um, again, we can always, you know, there's lots of ways that we can detect this, again, looking for web shells, looking for these sort of behaviors where, you know, suspicious child processes are spawning, you know, CMDs, power shells, things like that. Um, how do I defend myself against proxy not shell? So um, this has been rapidly evolving guidance. Um, Microsoft has put this out and revised this a couple of times. Um, there is no patch for this at the moment. Um, 
there, there may and likely be just kind of given the severity of this. Uh, the mitigations in place right now are applying a URL rewrite rule. Um, so basically anything that has that, um, that string with the auto discover and PowerShell, um, setting that up to block that request. And again, if that request is being blocked, then you're not going to be able to go through. Um, there have been some modifications to this. Obviously, um, you know, with web URLs, you can do URL encoding, um, you know, some very small minor tweaks to things that would break the, the pattern that it's searching for. So, um, you know, that's obviously one thing that's been found by the blue teams and also very easily could be, um, you know, bypassed by the attackers. So if you did originally put in one of these rules, make sure that you update it, make sure that you have the um, most current version of this. Um, there are some other mitigation guidance here, and again, this is rapidly evolving, so definitely pay attention to this, check that out, but um, that's going to primarily be your first line of fence. Um, you can certainly block that at a web application firewall or other level. Um, you don't have to apply it directly to IIS, but that's likely going to be the best mode of attack. Um, that said, you should also still have this defense and really this detection in depth strategy. So. Um, if you did have that, you know, firewall rule, um, or really that web application firewall rule in place, and you know it was able to be bypassed, you know, having detections to be able to look for that suspicious and malicious activity are going to be, you know, really important here. Um, so again, this threat actor um, that's been exploiting this so far has pretty much been um, attributed to China. You're going to see the China Chopper web shell activity. So um, this is another blog from Microsoft um, analyzing some of what they've been seeing here. Again, we've got that W3WP, the IIS service, and various commands that are associated with China Chopper. Um, you've got, again, uh, this one here is looking for web shells being placed in one of the directories. So this is that front end HTTP proxy folder. Um, there's definitely a lot of detections around here. Um, again, without having a threat to reproduce, it's a little bit harder to validate these, but that's something we'll do when we do see POCs out there. Uh, we do have a collection around proxy not shell for our customers uh, you can if you're a subscriber you can check a look take a look at those and again we've got detections that you can deploy to your um, sims your edrs with one click to make sure that you're defended and again this is one of those things where detection in depth is very important because again there are ways and it has been known that you can bypass some of these um, you know url rewrites and those blocks there so having that history there is good um, the other thing to just kind of note for some of these, again, that, you know, suspicious parent-child process between W3WP and, you know, PowerShell or CMD or some of these others, these are a little bit more evergreen techniques. Again, these are behavioral-based detections. So things like that that were deployed before for proxy shell also would have had you defended already for this zero day when that was released. So there is definitely an advantage to having those type of detections in your network. Um, so definitely check those out if you're a customer. Um, moving on, uh, next thing I wanted to talk about was Brute Retell. So this is a command and control, a C2, or they're calling it a C4 um, a tool. And again, most similarly to Cobalt Strike, again, it's a commercial you know, tool for red teams to, again, do their engagements. But this is also widely used now by threat actors and is going to be a lot more widely used here um, in the future because there was a, a pretty big leak here. Um, MDSEC, a, a commercial security company, um, I don't know if this was intentional, if this was accidental, um, just some OPSEC failures. They uploaded the full uh, Brute Retell, you know, package here. So this is the 122 release. Um, uh, so it's, you see a big file size, 108 megabytes. Um, and if you have a virus total account, you could totally go on here. You could download the sample. This is forever going to be there. And certainly this has been, you know, uh, pulled down by uh, threat actors, by other, you know, hackers and, and people. It has been, you know, the, uh, what do we call it? The licensing and all those other controls have been bypassed. So uh, this is definitely going to be used a lot more by threat actors. And I think a question is a lot of it, why? Um, very much, very powerful for a C2 framework. Lots of features, again, for Stealth C2, DNS over uh, HTTPS, uh, external C2 channels. Um, some areas where I think this outshines Cobalt Strike and some of the others. Again, they have a lot of um, indirect syscalls, so think syswhispers and stuff. Um, being able to uh, bypass a lot of the EDR detections, so their, their hooked you know, um, API calls and things, being able to obfuscate that. 
um, it makes the, the um, implant itself, um, which Brutel they call Badger, this is synonymous to Cobalt Strike's beacon, uh, very hardened against detection, very hardened against a lot of your first line of defenses. Um, lots of other cool features in here. So uh, again, it's a pretty powerful tool. Uh, it is a one-man shop that does it, so that's you know equally impressive. Uh, again, he does have a, a pretty interesting background working at both um, Mandiant and uh, CrowdStrike on their red teams. But um, again, this is a pretty sophisticated tool, but I think there's going to be a lot of eyes on it. So do want to give a shout out to the security research team at Splunk. Um, they have a fantastic blog post and clearly they've been working on Brute Rattel here for a while. So um, they had a, a little earlier version that they've been analyzing. Um, they pulled it apart, both um, some of the ways that people are using this for initial access. So um, you're going to see here kind of using a, a malicious IS, an ISO file, um, mounting that, and we're going to actually dive into this, um, you know, OneDrive side loading attack here. Um, but that's, you know, one of the ways that, um, you know, it's being detected. There's uh, lots of other things here. I'm not going to dive in too much here. This is a very in-depth read. Um, I really also do like that they have their own um, internal Atomic C2 framework, so being able to Again, in their eyes, reverse engineer um, the framework, being able to run and simulate the attacks and actually control the Badger implant without the server component. So I think you're going to see a lot more security research around those and kind of weaponizing malware for the purpose of defending against it to understand exactly how it works and how it's controlled. Because um, again, that server component is often rarely seen unless it's been you know leaked out there. So um, definitely take a look at this. Again, I think one of the outcomes here is they have their um, their analytic playbooks and their detections. So um, different ways that they have, whether it's um, hunting or whether it's something that you can alert on um, around Brute Rattel. Um, if you're really tracking this threat, take a look. Um, we'll be working on porting and migrating these to um, snap attacks so that all customers of ours can take advantage of these, not just rules that are, again, written in Splunk or for Splunk customers, but again, really impressive research by the team. And again, there's a lot of research that's been going around. Um, Unit 42 also has a really good deep dive on this, um, as does MDSEC. Um, again, there was the, you know, How I Met Your Beacon uh, talks that they gave and, and really talked about Brute Rattel. Um, again, this one here, again, they're finding a lot of use here for this um, like initial ISO file and this um, side loading thing. Um, so that's the attack that we're actually going to take a look at today um, because, again, I think that is very interesting. It is an initial access vector. So um, this here POC that is referenced in um, that uh, Unit 42 blog post, um, this actually implements that. So it's going to sideload the version DLL um, and it's going to call OneDrive update, which again is a signed Microsoft binary that's on most uh, Windows machines. It's going to have you know Office and an Office environment. And again, this can be used to load well, really anything. Um, you could use it to load Cobalt Strike. You could use it to load um, you know, Badger. You could use it to load you know, Meterpreter, which is what we have here. So we have this session, um, this captured threat. Uh, again, it's available to subscribers. You can take a look. Uh, and again, we, we basically recreated those steps here. So um, if I open this up, um, we can see that we have this um, important uh, ISO file. Uh, sitting on the desktop. Um, thanks Microsoft for making it very easy to mount these. Um, there are some hidden files on the ISO. There is a kind of readme shortcut, which is what people might click. Um, you can see really nothing happened here. Again, we're not doing anything, um, you know, like popping a calc. Um, so it's very transparent. Um, again, if you wanted to make this a little bit more legitimate, uh, you might pop open a, a PDF or something with the resume. Feel like I've seen that being one of the um, kind of initial access vectors of, you know, hey, you know, take a look at this this office document or things. Um, why they're using ISO files, I don't know. Again, this really should be good user awareness training and you know your spear phishing training of why am I not just seeing that attachment directly and why is it in that kind of weird packaging, but. Um, this is definitely something that it does get around a lot of security tools and is highly effective. So I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of these. And uh, again, we can hop over here. So again, we're using that technique to, um, you know, launch an interpreter. Um, you can see here that that, you know, got that callback. We ran, you know, um, basically the who am I equivalent to get the user. So we have code execution through this method. Um, 
Again, you can take a look at all of that. You can see the detections. Um, process graph, again, we can see here what that kind of looks like. So clicking that shortcut, there is that, you know, CMD, um, starting the OneDrive update, and again, that DLL side loading here. So there definitely are some detections around this. Um, I will say here, and again, this is going back to the uh, Brute Rattel author, this DLL side loading te technique that we're going to see a lot more, um, and again, this is more for the red teams. Um, sometimes it doesn't appear to work and it feels kind of like, why is this, you know, not working? And particularly, again, one of the reasons we used a meterpreter shell there is it was a staged payload instead of a stageless. So much smaller implant, much less in terms of dependencies. Um, you can have this sort of recursive loop of your side loaded DLL requires another DLL. And again, this is what he's calling a, a loader lock. So um, because of that, where you have these kind of circular dependencies, it's just going to uh, fail to load. So be aware of that if you're um, trying to test or replicate these threats, um, that not every DLL that you want to load will work out of the box and it may have some, some tweaks that you need. Um, how do I defend against this? So again, there's lots of detections that we have. Um, this one in particular here is, again, basically looking for those um, system DLLs being sideloaded from non-system locations. So again, this DLL should be in System32 or SysWow64, one of the other directories. So being able to look for DLLs that are, again, say, mounted to an ISO file, um, again, that's going to be bad. So those are some very easy things to detect. And again, this is not actually a detection against the uh, Brute Rattel or Badger itself. Um, those are coming, but this is one of those ways that you can get that off before um, it actually is going to be launched and really that initial access, which... Again, this is where, you know, any C2 framework, any malware is going to be most, you know, vulnerable is because you've got antivirus, you've got EDR, you've got every other security tool pointed against it, watching its every move as it starts up, as it starts doing those things. And before it really has a chance to evade those detections, um, you know, heading these off at the initial access vector is the most important part. So again, you know, snap attack customers, one click deploy. Uh, feeling Splunk today. So I can go ahead, I can deploy this to my Splunk. And again, if I have this log source up here, um, you know, I can have immediate protection and detection from, you know, this sort of threat. Uh, definitely, we will be taking a look and doing a deeper dive on Brute Rattel. Um, we've already been doing some research here with the, um, you know, the compromised uh, C2 framework that was put out there. So a um, couple of sessions, a couple of threats that we've captured here. Um, you'll definitely see more, and we'll do a whole deep dive on that at a later date. Well, anyways, that's the snapshot for this week. Uh, thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, and we'll see you next time.